Ladies and gentlemen, sorry it's been so long, but we are back. Welcome to the Sling and Lead Podcast. I'm TJ. I forget my line. It's been too long. It has been too long. What, what am I supposed to say? You're Kent. You're Kent. I almost knew. You know, <laughs> I saw that coming. You really should have. As, as as soon as it as soon as I said it, I'm like, he's going to say it, isn't he? He's going to exact. He's going to do the exact same thing. He's going to say it, and he. I've you don't been rehearsing dis- that all day. You don't, dis- you don't disappoint, buddy. You don't disappoint at all. All I'm right. Kent. Yeah. Yes, you are Kent, and I'm this is Kent. episode 145 of the Sling Led Podcast, talking about rolling your own freedom seed. So, guys, late lately, um, and we'll get into a catch up segment. Uh, where we kind of explain where the hell we've been for the last what two months um, eh, 48 it, days plus or minus yeah, something like that um but yeah things have been absolutely crazy but tonight uh or over the last couple of weeks Kent and i've been talking about reloading um just kind of you know getting back into the swing of things getting some custom load development done for hunting season um and all that other good stuff um so that's what tonight's episode's about uh but First and foremost, let's find out where the hell we've been. So, Kent, you want to want to kind of explain to everybody what the hell you've been up to lately? Hi, my name's Kent, and I run a gun training company. I've been a recovering firearms trainer for approximately 14 years. I continue to get busier and busier and busier. And I go to the range and teach people things uh, a lot, every day, every fucking day. <laughs> Like mm-hmm. a lot, uh, yeah, dude. Uh, been hanging out with the James, been hanging out with the Sofers, teaching all the time. Day job is less and less and less of a of a real everyday concern for me anymore. Uh, still teaching the college classes at the SDI, still doing the day job, kinda. GMD is is just as straight out as it could possibly ever be, um. Looking at future projects, 2024 and beyond, writing three and five year development plans for my personal private business. I mean, I've 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 been uh, in my career. I've written a couple, you know, 30, 60, 90s, and a couple couple 180s and beyonds, and a couple. You know, corporate America has nice ways of saying future planning and forecasting. Uh with GMD, my future planning and forecasting used to be sell lessons, teach lessons. Drink, shoot guns, repeat, sell classes, teach classes. And now it's like, hey, where, where are we going to be in three and five? And it's really, really daunting, but so fucking rewarding at the same time. So I've been doing a lot of that. And uh, I'll be honest with you, man. I've been prioritizing my social time. My social time all goes to my son because there's none of it left. So that's what I've been doing. What about you besides, besides shooting deers? One of yeah. us has got a deer on the ground this year. Yeah, one of us got a deer on the ground. Um, is this guy? Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, truth be told, nothing to write home about as far as the whole deer, the whole slaughter of the delicious deer goes. Um, uh, so earlier in November, um, been involved with another ransomware case. Um, another another location got hit uh, that falls into the purview of the company that I work for for a day job. And uh, been involved with that ever since. Um, this one was particularly nasty, uh, but client recovered well. Uh, still on the path to recovery, but almost there. Uh, so that that's, I mean, as as bad as it was, I'll be honest with you, brother. I, I'm surprised this isn't like another, you know, 2021 special where I'm locked into it for four months. Um, certainly not the case here, but they they took a they took a hard hard strike to the chin. That's for sure. Um, so been dealing if with that. I was one of these people, the, wait, the victim, not, the victim or the threat actor, I was thinking threat actor in this case, if I was the threat actor, I would pick somebody else's clients to fuck with other than yours. Well, uh, to be clear, not a client before I got involved with, them, with <laughs> well, the right okay. case. <laughs> but now they are. Yeah. 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 Um, dude, nothing would please me more than to watch these people be hunted down and dragged down the street behind of old boys F-150. Right? I do have an F-150. Um, you do have an F-150, and I've got chain and rope. I think we can make something work, Tater. But Just saying. 
Uh, yeah, man, it, th- this one, these people, I swear, and they have no remorse whatsoever. They know exactly what they do. As a matter of fact, they even use our own regulatory requirements against us. Um, your your own regulatory requirements, meaning federal law. Yeah, federal law, yeah. regulatory, uh, state, even state and local, um, you know, laws that might apply uh, to entities that might get hit. Um, uh, so I'll give you an example, right? This is a, a similar example, um, but any other company, let's say the company might be publicly traded, right? They will report to the SEC about what they did to your organization. Right. You know, and naturally, right. when you have a company... trying to negatively affect the stock value of a company. Um, that and also just to pressure you. I mean, let's just say hypothetically, and now let's be clear, I don't deal in, in the financial sector, but um, let's just even say hypothetically that that organization wouldn't have received any penalties or punishment from the SEC for um, a cybersecurity breach, although that's highly probable that they would. Um, again, I don't deal in the financial sector, so I don't know all the ins and outs of the SEC oversight and regulatory requirements and guidelines for uh, reporting the cybersecurity breach. But they will openly say like, hey, look, we stole your data. We encrypted all your files and it's hard for, you know, you can't get back in your systems. Recovery is going to take you at least a month and a half, two months um, between the lawyer's fees, your forensics fees, everybody that you're going to have to bring in, pay overtime. You know, it's going to cost you, pl- plus the fact that your business isn't running right now, right? It's going to cost you tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. By the way, the average cost of a cybersecurity breach right now is around ten and a half million dollars. Just universally. Um, hey, you could pay us a million and a half and we'll give you all your shit back right now and you're good to go. Right. Or you could pay us right. a million and a half and we still won't give you all your shit back right now. And then we'll double down on being criminals. Hmm. Believe it or not, in some rare instances, I actually see the opposite to be true. Yeah. I actually I actually do see them, if they have been paid, I do see them backing off. Little honor however, on thieves. However, a little bit. However, that doesn't mean that they won't just give that information that they have about your organization when they hack you to one of their buddies, and then their buddies' organizations will go hack you. So it's like... All right, I fended off Al Qaeda. Now I've got to fight ISIS, right? So Dick Cheney just got a boner if he's still alive. Yeah, somebody at Lockheed Martin's just like yeah. fully fully erect right now. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. But yeah, so that that's kind of the nature of the beast, man. Um, so now that being said, I never trust them, and I always encourage my clients never to trust these people. They are they are criminals after all. Uh, but it's interesting how enterprising and almost borderline business oriented they can be. Uh, so, like I said, that's what I've been putting up with for the last month. And uh, man, is what it you guys don't policy. realize is that when TJ gets off this podcast, he flips a switch behind him just next to his uh, character from the uh, what's that called? What's what is that called? The Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. Yeah. So he flips a little switch next to Slimer, and the thing goes, and then the panels behind him like fold open and disappear, and a big glass room full of other beep boopers appears behind him, and he turns his chair around to look down upon his beep booping minions, and he goes, yes. How much money have we ransomed from them today? <laughs> and then he, then, no, 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 no. I was thinking like more like Men in Black style. Like there's like B Borbs and Z News like walking around. Like like some dude from Mars is like, hey, TJ. And you're like, how you doing, buddy? That's, that's why I, I just, that's why I just tell everybody I'm in, in, I'm in cybersecurity because if I were to tell them the truth, they would go cross eyed and I'd have to explain it to them. So, right. yeah. The full truth about what he does for a living literally hurts my skull. Mine too. <laughs> Fucking like literally, I'm like, okay, I shoot guns good. I'm good. I'm over here. Yeah. Pretty fucking cool shit, man. Yeah. I'm always, I, I never get the opportunity to tell you, but I'm so proud of you for the work you do. I really am. I appreciate that, bud. I really it's do. It's really, all really right. cool. All the all the atrocities and war crimes that you helped commit for the federal government are now being paid back in droves by your philanthropies and your otherwise excellence. 
A girl's got to make a living. <laughs> Warhead, you went from warheads on foreheads to digitally saving proverbial housefuls of burning puppies and nuns. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just I always thought that was cool. Yeah, it's kind of cool when you put it that way, but damn it, I really wish it would quit cramping my style for my weekend activities. <laughs> so, so all I so, want to do is so, go to jujitsu. So, no shit. I was supposed to be off the day after that this happened, right? This happened on a Thursday. I was supposed to be off on that Friday, and I was going to go hunting because season had just opened up for black powder. I'd already gotten to go out and sit in the woods once. I was like, all right, I'm going to go out Friday. It's my day. I'm going to take a long weekend, get out super early. Thursday rolls around. Hey, man, we got a case. Ah, damn it. All right, fine. So we get into that. Clock rolls over to Friday morning. I finally get some sleep. I wake up, get back to work. I look at my trail cameras, and this monster buck is sitting there staring face-to-face with my trail camera. And I'm like, you know... That's about 20 yards away from where my ground blind is. I'm telling you, dude. Son of a bitch. If I didn't have the privacy screen on my cam or on my uh, phone, I'd pull it up and show everybody, but um, it doesn't work too well on the camera. But yeah. I saw a three by three. I'll text you the picture if I have it already. Just tonight, three by three at West Shore at six o'clock. Walking in the door to teach a private lesson. Standing on range two. Hello, sir. I'm like, you motherfucker, where were you at 4.45? And he says, fuck you, buddy. And he deers away. Yep. I wish West Shore didn't have such good security cameras because I'm telling you right now, I would have hate crime that motherfucker. (laughs) If I was anywhere else, I would have just went, whack. Yeah, so, well, and and that's why that's why the deer that I took is nothing to write home about because I literally, I went out Thanksgiving morning you know, we, we all took the day off. I was like, look, we're going, I'm going to go sit Thanksgiving morning. And I got into that ground blind Thanksgiving morning. I had a meeting at noon. Um, <laughs> just, you know, the, the daily touch point that we have with the executives for, for these victim organizations. And I was like, I don't care what it is. If it's not a human, it's getting shot. <laughs> and sure enough, something that wasn't human came out. What I thought was a, well, honestly, I thought was a doe. And then when I looked through my scope, I saw that one little that one little spike sticking up. I was like, I don't give a shit. You've got no spots. You got no mama nearby. You're going into the freezer. Whack. That's exactly the point. <laughs> so okay. legal light was at sunrise was at 630. He walked out at 645. He was in the free he was in the cooler by 830. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, good times. But um, I digress. Let's get on with it. Um, That's where we've been at, folks. Bottom line is, and you've heard it on the show before, life gets in the way and adulting sucks sometimes. But uh, to lead us into our conversation, we actually have a question from a viewer um, who had stumbled across, of all things, episode five with the one and only Ashton Ray of 360 Performance. Um, Complimented our show. Yeah, yeah. He's a great guy. Uh, we got to have him back on the show. It's been a hot minute. Because last time we talked to him, it was about lube, I think. <laughs> That's right. Because he's a frobologist. Gesundheit. Um, he, he's a lube, a, a lube doctor. Right. Literally a frobologist, a doctor of lubrication. Doctor? Doctor. Doctor. Um, anyway, so homeboy, anyway, homeboy episode yeah. five. Yeah, episode five. Around, about, so about shotguns. Okay. Can you give uh, me so, a rough date of one epi- what 2018? I don't remember, dude. I'd have to go back and look at it. I was honestly just so excited that we we had a, a, a such a positive review on the on the episode. Um fun fact, YouTube's apparently burying our shit under the algorithm somewhere. So yeah. anyway, um after uh some back and forth with the complimentary uh or the compliments uh and the the uh, appreciation for our content. Um, we got to talking and he asked a question. He said, why is it either eight or nine pellet double lot buck? If I can get 12, 12 pellets of double lot in a two and three quarter shell, why aren't we trying to have heavier payloads that are copper plated and buffered and under the 1400 feet per second in that flight control wad? 
If I can still fit seven servings in my gun with three inch shells, why not 15 pellet of double lot? Um, uh, why aren't we see why aren't we seeing heavy ass flight control loads? Uh, end quote. <clears throat> uh, that's a very easy, uh, a very solid question and a reasonable question. After all, we have talked on this show many times about serving size, uh, the overall lethality and the efficacy of double lot buck. Um, insert Clint Smith quote here about removing a chunk of shit and throwing that shit on the floor. Uh, the reality of the situation is uh, when you're dealing with, um, call it a scattering defense load, it is vitally important to be precise and intentional and deliberate with your shot placement. Um, anything over that nine pellets, things start to scatter really well. To your point, um, it you know, 15 pellets, 13 pellets, whatever have you, sure as hell going to make more of a whack or a whammy on your intended target. Uh, but the reality is, is you can't guarantee exactly where all of those pellets are going to go. Um, any student of the shotgun will be familiar with the, the theory of the uh, or the axiom of the ninth pellet flyer. Um, and the reality is that's a true thing. Um, even if you were to use the flight control wad, you will um, not be able to control in flight all of those rounds because as they go down the, the bore of a shotgun, they start bouncing around all over each other or at least wanting to. Um, and so you probably get a spread you were not intending. Although you're more than welcome to try it out, go out to the flat range, set up a target, various distances, considering the longest range in your house, and pattern that shit. Uh, quite frankly, if you are going to uh, use a shotgun for home defense, I don't care if you're using flight control or any, or, you know, Remington, you know, or uh, what was the other, the Winchester Double A, you know, Gucci stuff. Um, your shotgun may not even like flight control eight pellet very well. Uh, so always pattern your shotgun loads, but that's the reason why. Also so column that, stacking. Also column stacking, yes. Um, with that being said, um, you know, as we talk about rolling your own freedom seeds, obviously loading shotgun shells or hulls is a piece of that. I do have a shotgun loader. Um, I used to compete in three gun uh, competitions, uh, went through a hell of a lot of birdshot. Um, also really appreciated the opportunity to, just like with all my other reloading equipment, uh, being able to tune my rounds for a particular degree of performance. If I'm just trying to bust a clay out to, you know, 20, 30, 40 yards, not really worried about stopping power. Uh, so being able to bunny fart those things to where they'll bust a clay, good enough for me, allows me to be faster on the gun, less felt recoil, etc. That being said, I can tell you from a reloading perspective, reloading shotgun shells is a necessity to a degree if you are a competitive shotgunner. Or any, uh, any other use case would be, you know, funsies. <laughs> wait, wait, I got another use case for you. I'm listening. If you're an oddity shotgun user, such as a 16 gauge. Yeah, that's or fair. A 28 gauge aficionado. Or if you want defensive ammo for a 20 gauge. Mm -hmm. And you'd like to try to replicate some of the stuff that's being done in a 12. Or, I don't know. The rest of it is pretty much just funsies. Right. Yeah. yeah. The, it, and in, it, even when, and I've got one of the Lee uh, shotgun uh, reloaders. Um, man, it, it's really fun. I think it's cool if you, as a hobby, you know, if you want to get, you know, maybe you want to load some some salt rounds or stack some dimes into one of them things. Oh, that's the that's the other thing I was gonna say. You can put anything you want in a fucking shotgun hole. I'm yeah, that, to say that 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 is one of the cool things about it. But from like a cost saving or any other reason that you would load metallic cartridges, it kind of goes downhill from there, right? Dude, I want to do force on force shotgun rounds full of skittles. Just so, fucking taste the rainbow, bitch. So I actually, before we started this this this, <laughs> this recording, I was actually watching Kentucky Ballistics, who, who loaded a handful of Skittles into a 308 can cannon and fired them at a gentleman who willingly volunteered. Um, and I can tell you, those things leave some marks. Dude, I'm gonna t I'm gonna tell you right now. If you were shooting at me with candy, I will be mouth agape. I'll just be <laughs> <laughs> like, you and, your you 
and your dentist will be happier than a Russian cyber threat actor who's ransoming <laughs> a facility. A Russian cyber threat actor who's ransoming a literal orphanage full of puppies and nuns. Yeah, that's about the size of it. So, all right. What happened so, to your teeth, cat? Skittles. Damn, dude. How many did you eat? Yeah. Oh. One, <laughs> about 42 uh, ounces worth. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's the thing. Uh, when we're talking about loading, uh, that's, I mean, I think that's all the time we're going to spend on shot shells. If you want to do it, do it. Just understand. Uh, especially with the, it, this is another thing that I ended up getting away from it with. When, when bird shot, like seven and a half shot, eight shot is 20 bucks for a hundred. I can't reload them that cheap. And quite frankly, reloading shot shells to do it properly is so much of a pain in the ass, right? When we talk about metallic cartridge reloading, you've got your grain weight, your bullet profile, right? The, the weight of the bullet, seating depth, neck tension, if you're going to actually crimp the uh, the neck of the case. Um, there's, there's very few little things that you can modify. There are so many different variables when you're loading a shotgun shell that it... It, it is a complete pain in the ass. I still have the same bag of number eight shot. I've still got the same bag of hulls and, and wads and all that other shit that I've used from over a decade ago when I was competing in three gun because it's way too much of a hassle, right? Uh, it's a complete pain in the ass. So, uh, but Kent, you wanted to talk about reloading to a certain degree. Um, yeah, I, before, before I kick it over to you and, and we go throttle down on this some bitch, um, I will tell you guys, if you're looking at getting into reloading, so this is the comment for the beginners out there, um, get a solid single stage to start with. Um, I like single stages, especially when I tell you that the best thing to start learning to reload on is a rifle cartridge not only from a learning of the skill set, but and obviously getting into load development and really trying to tune that load in, but also from a safety perspective. It is really, really, really hard to double charge a rifle cartridge because of the amount, the volume of powder that you're putting into these things. When I first started reloading, I had a Lee single stage. I have this, I still have it. My single stage right now is a Lee uh, breach breach lock i think they call it lee challenger breach lock i think it's called and i started loading 300 blackout right um 308 seven you know uh 5.56 all these different car uh, rifle cartridges that i started reloading as i was learning the skill and i yeah it's it is nearly impossible i don't know of a single time you could double charge a rifle load so long as it is not, you're not trying to load for subsonic. I think you could do it with 300 blackout if you're loading subsonic rounds. But if you're loading full power, high velocity ammo, you're going to spill powder all over your damn self before, you know, and realize that you made a mistake before you load a double charged rifle case into a gun. So it can be daunting. It can be intimidating. I assure you it is not. Um, my kids help me. It, it's not hard to do at all. Just, but it, there, you got to take your time and do do some due diligence and pay attention to what you're doing. Kent, over to you. Yeah, gonna say, are you done being wrong? You're wrong. I'm not wrong. I think you just said 100 percent wrong. What you should do is you should get a Dylan 1050, an auto an Autobot loader thing that you flip the flipping thing on there. You should get some tight group. You should turn that knob away. I don't know how much tight group. We'll see what happens. You should fucking press the button on that thing. And whatever comes out of the automated machine, you should put in somebody else's gun. Not your own. Somebody else's first. That's well, and awesome. then you could learn then you could learn the essential skill of um <laughs> of pulling bullets from all of those cases, which you nah, realize you what a horrible mistake. Nah, you, you ain't got to pull the bullets. You just got to give them to a different friend. It'll be all right. Dude, I yeah. watched I watched a fellow at West Shore blow up two guns in one afternoon. Testing, re testing reloads. Remind me not to shoot some of your reloads. Not my reloads, his own. Oh. 
No. A likely I'm, story. I'm, I'm kidding. I don't I, I do do all of the things I just said. I just don't do them without experience. Uh yeah, so my reloading journey was probably largely different than TJ's. Uh for one thing, I have reached I would I would say that to different degrees and different subject matters, I've reached the same level of mechanical aptitude that TJ possesses today. The difference is he he came about mechanical aptitude way younger as a man than I did. So when he was in his early twenties, he was more mechanically inclined than I was by a mile. Is that am I tracking? Is that making sense? It's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. Keep going. <laughs> well, just like like you were more more analytical at that age. Because when we talk, like, I want y'all to keep in mind, when I talk shit about shooting and I'm like, yeah, man, I've been doing this for 36 minus, uh, shit, I've been doing this 16 years now or whatever. I'm not a 50-year-old guy. I know this might make you think otherwise. Uh, But we were young guys when we got into learning this shit, both of us. Mm -hmm. So... A young man, a young TJ, a 23-year-old TJ uh, loading his first rifle rounds and a 23-year-old Kent loading his first rifle rounds were different men. Very, very different men. You, uh, but at that point in your life, you'd been you'd been to war. Like, you'd seen some shit already. You were way more mechanically inclined. You were way, way, way more analytical. And you had a better understanding of firearms in your early development with guns than I did. I I think it comes real quick. I don't think it comes down to um, any type of a natural talent or skill other than I have a very inquisitive nature. And the best way that I satisfy my inquisitive nature is through the practical usage and application of doing said thing. Um, You know, in a little yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I've I've actually been I've been accused numerous times of being overly analytical. Um, mm-hmm, me too. But uh, so, for example, uh, you know, in, in my my dad, you know, a lot of it, you know, a lot of you say, oh, this is, you know, good old boy from Tennessee. Uh, the reality is, is you know, my dad's never. I, I don't know that my dad's ever reloaded. Um, and I saw the utility and the 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 use case um for getting into such a skill set and having that skill and that trait under my belt and i was like fuck it i'm gonna do it um so went and got everything started reading started you know started diving into it and learning on my own and i approach a lot of things in life that way so like recently and i've always dabbled with the stock market and, and kent and i have been talking about this lately um, I got introduced to a, a, a course material, a set of course materials um, that explained a different approach to trading. Um, so like prime example, to try this thing, I opened up a stock trading account. I threw a few thousand dollars into it and I'm like, all right, I'm t- it's time to risk it for the biscuit. And I followed that, that procedure and that's how I do things. Right. Yes, sir. Is risk it for the biscuit a lyrical reference to vaginas? Depends on where you're from, maybe. I pretty sure. Maybe. Did it offer the nookie? The nookie. Yeah, the nookie. Oh Jesus. So you can take that cookie. I actually heard that song on the radio the other day. Um, but yeah, so I mean that's just the way I approach things though. Yeah, you do. Anyway, my point is, uh Unfortunately, I'm actually the good old boy in the group here. My daddy done did teach me to reload. And he taught me to tie flies. And he taught me to hunt. And he taught me to fish. And he taught me to shoot. He taught me all this shit. And I uh, applaud him for his ability to catch his son's interest in those topics. And I now know that he had not a free fucking iota of an idea what the hell he was doing (laughs) in any of that shit at all whatsoever. Not even close. His level of knowledge, skill, or experience in any one of those topics was sophomoric at best. And I am so lucky to have both my fucking thumbs because, oh, boy, old Tommy Howard did not know how to reload. But he did reload. So, you know, it's this is another one of those things in my life, which is like, my dad taught 
me to fight. He taught me to drive. He taught me to shoot. He taught me to fish. He taught me to hunt. He taught me to reload. Just, I mean, it sounds like Tim Allen. I should just be like, <laughs> like that shit. But here's the truth of it. The further away I got from his tutelage, the further deep I got into it on my own, the literal college degree I went and got in subject matter like ballistics, the fucking hours of life I put into studying this. Holy shit. Like, I love you, Pops, but, you know, I, I hate to speak you all the dead, but, yeesh. like, it was wild, dude. So, I made all the mistakes. I, I made all the mistakes. I jumped into progressive reloading way before I was really mentally capable of understanding what I was undertaking. Mm -hmm. I followed volumetric reloading recipes. Do you understand what I mean by a volumetric reloading recipe? The yellow scooper yeah. that comes with the, the dipper. fucking die set. The, the dipper. That dipper has so much tight group in it or so much Varget or so much IMR 4233 in it. Give me a dip and a half, son. That motherfucker told a 10-year-old to give him a dip and a half and didn't double measure. Good God. Mm -hmm. All right? So, like, dude, by the time I got to where I was really having an understanding of ballistics and pressures and what even affected pressure and why and everything else, I had already made mistakes. I, dude, I blew up a gun. I, I would have I, loved to have been in the room as you started, like, discovering proper reloading and then like that sudden epiphany of holy shit my dad almost killed me <laughs> dude like <laughs> look i i remember i can remember dad being on the phone with marlon and being like that's 30 30 it came with a bad chamber and i want you guys you bitch he told that boy three scoops i mean i don't know what to tell you man but like I'm certain I blew up a gun, uh, you know. And even in adult life, as I got uh, an understanding of the reloading topic, I would tell you that I, you know, the progressive reloading machine that I didn't fully comprehend, even when I thought I did, allowed a 380 case to make its way through with a batch of 9 millimeter. Decapped, decapped, resized, powder, primer, projectile. I never caught it. I put three point, yeah, now there's a one fifteen load. I put about four point two grains of tight group under a hundred hundred fifteen grain projectile in a case that had about sixty percent the available volume in the case that I thought I was loading. Right, thirty three eighty versus nine mil. So I turned that little three eighty into a fucking grenade. And I didn't even know I did it. I blew up a sig. Uh, Sig 320RX, the first one ever to come with the Romeo site on it. Right. It was like 2015 or whatever. Um, you know, because I didn't, I didn't understand, I didn't understand how to better tune the machine to keep it from doing that at that time. Mm -hmm. Like, so, so what I'm going to say is like most things, right? I've arrived at the point now where, I, you know, I do one of these things and I can see three reloading presses from here. And I load a very high percentage of the ammo that my training company shoots for me to make a living. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't have crazy problems. I'm not saying anything's ever problem free because it's not. <laughs> but I left dangerous in the, in the rear view mirror a very long time ago. And it's kind of interesting for me to think about the familial, like what, where you're getting your information and who you're just sort of giving a pass to because shit, man, that's pops, man. Pops knows. I'm sure pops knows. And if you think about it, pops didn't know shit, right? Oh boy. Oh boy. Like he knew what he knew, but I mean, every, every dude's born thinking he could fight fucking what's the other one drive. Yeah. 
most of us can't do either either any of them three things very well, as it turns out. Like people just aren't the Dunning Kruger thing's real. So that's my first my first little cautionary tale here is Dunning Kruger. Right? Like like be afraid to understand that you don't know what you don't know. Now, once we're past that point, what I would tell you is reloading is one of those things where you need a mentor. If you're going to get into this, and I don't, did you have a loading mentor? Because I did not. I do now. No. But I did not, you know. No, I I will say, well, hold on. So let's unpack that for a second. So when you say reloading mentor, if you mean, did I have somebody that would come over or maybe sit down with me even in their shop and be like, hey, you know, this is what's what this is the ins and outs of reloading or hey you know when you did your recipe did you think about doing it this way that way or the other way uh no the answer is no i did not have that but when i would go to the range and i would talk about like oh yeah man i'm trying this new recipe or you know i'm trying these new loads um and they're like hey dude that works great that's by the book but try this out right much softer shooting it'll still cycle your gun right whatever have you um and then now Actually, no, I take that back. I did. I did have a reloading mentor. I had a buddy of mine who taught me a little bit more about load development for precision rifle shooting. So he taught me more about the intricacies of load development for precision rifle accuracy, right? So like he's the reason I was able to take a, you know, $500 Ruger American Predator and have it shooting quarter MOA groups at 100 yards. Right. Because he showed me the ins and outs and the intricacies of rifle load development. Um, and I still carry the, the, that 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 tutelage with me today. And he, he was my age. You know, he wasn't so he wasn't like it wasn't like I still got the shovel, you know, buried out past Terra <laughs> Right. Um, it wasn't like that. It, it, dude, literally my age. But he came from from we met shooting three gun. And he uh, but he started he didn't start in three gun. He started in PRS matches. Oh, cool. See, my dude, my guy now, I was already a perfectly functional, knowledgeable, capable reloader mm-hmm. by the time I, I met a fellow we'll call Pat. And he is the Shovel Terra Lingua man, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm honored to say, or I'm pleased to say, or encouraged to say, that nothing I was doing was wrong by the time I met him. I wasn't off base on anything, but there were definitely refinements that I wasn't aware I could make. He was able to help me refine some stuff and really just reduce uh, failure rates. Mm -hmm. Really just like, like, like the rounds I made when they were great were great. And some of them were were not great, but not functional, not, not great in a dangerous way, too much powder, too much pressure. Just like, why the fuck did the overall length change from 1.10 to 1.32 with the same projectile? Well, that head stamp brass stretches differently. Mm-hmm. Fucking what? Yep. You guys are sorting head stamps? It's like, no. Yeah, dude, I, I'm telling you, that's all shit you will learn. Dude. That's why I always encourage you yeah. to start with rifle. Because I'll tell you right now, for precision rifle, that shit matters. Sure it does. Well, it does for it does for non-precision pistol, too, because the brass act's different. Right. So, anyway, my point is, seek out a mentor. My second point is, Johnny Dickhead... Oh, I can't get my hand on his screen. Duh. Johnny Dickhead on the internet, both of us, are not your mentor. The next guy in the next YouTube video is not your fucking mentor. Uh, with with few exceptions, I would say that most information <clears throat> regarding re- regarding reloading is a, is a disaster online. Mm-hmm. A fucking unmitigated disaster. A uh, notable notable mention of exception would be uh, Gavin from the Ultimate Reloader channel, who does phenomenal work. 
Oh, absolutely. I love that show or his channel. His great channel, period. His whole channel. Everything. I'll tell you, you want to do things with precision in anything as far as related, you find yourself an engineer like that, dude. So, so that's so, so Pat, uh, lifelong machinist, right? Right. Guys, you do that kind of shit for a living. It's amazing what they know and, and what they could show you on your tools. Uh, but I, I was looking up. Oh, the other night I was shopping for components as an example. I was looking for primers and uh, saw a great deal on the ammo seek for uh, Servicios y Avitalos, whatever the fuck primers, Argentinian small pistol primers. I mean, the Argentinians were responsible for the Bay of Pigs, apparently, so they might as well have good pistol primers. I, I don't know if they had, I don't think they had anything to do with the bad pigs, but it sounded funny. So like, I'm going to go with it. It's fine. Everything's fine. Moving on. Um, What's Argentina known for? Housing Nazis? No, that's Brazil. No, no, that's Argentina. Do they, do they have them in Argentina too? Yeah. Yeah. yeah Brazil yeah. is a shitload of Nazis. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of, kind of in the same continent. Anyway, point being, um, they're the Mexicans to other Mexicans further south. Look, look when you get it into geopolitics, uh, <laughs> not really anyway. my for not really my forte, but let's move on. Anyway, small fistle primers from Argentina. I looked them up, right? Huh. These things are a couple cents per primer cheaper than anything else on the market right now. I'm gonna look them bitches up, see if I see what I think of. I'm gonna buy fifty thousand of them motherfuckers, right? Like I'm not that. Uh, as with most things, gun related, shooting related, training related, you, your boy ain't fucking round. So when I'm doing something, I'm doing. Like I'm looking to go. I'm gonna spend three thousand dollars on primers. I'd like to know if they do or don't suck, and at what rate I can expect them to suck. So I googled. Cervezos and the Americo fucking small pistol primers. I love how it's a different name every time you say it. I I, I don't know. S and A. I forget what the A is. Anyway, okay. I saw a video from Bubba Fud 362 at AOL.com on the YouTubes where he was like, all right, fellas, we're going to test out some of these hair primers from Argentina. Okay. He loaded up a bunch of rounds on camera. He looked just like my dad. Scoop of powder, scoop of powder, scoop of powder, bullet, hammer. Good enough, right? Like, it just looked wild to me. He was loading on a single stage press, and it was taking him like 50 seconds around to load him. Right. He was just, he, he was bop, bop, beep, bop, 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 beep, bop, bop, boom. There's one, bop, 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 just. It looked like a ham-fisted monkey. I didn't see him measure shit. I didn't see a freaking caliper come out once. He didn't chamber check a goddamn thing. <clears throat> he didn't weigh his powder. Yellow scooper. Yellow scooper. Yellow scooper. Good. Just that kind of shit, right? hmm He got them rounds out to the range. And he would put them in his Taurus G3X. Right? And he's like, Some bitch didn't go off. Moves the magazine, racks the pistol, grabs that round, struggles to rack the pistol. And I'm like, did it not go off because of the primer? Or did it not go off because it never went into battery? We'll never know. Because he took that magazine in and went. Bah! Got one to go off. Did that 10 times in a row. Six out of them 10 rounds failed. And he said, these primers aren't any good. Thanks for watching the Bubba Fudd 362 at AOL.com YouTube channel. Y'all have a pleasant evening. And the banjo music played. And you're just sitting there like, that motherfucker thinks he just did science. <laughs> like, he, like, I swear to God. Like, he's... He went upstairs and he was like, you know, honey, I'm not trying to brag, but that's probably pretty... the best content I've ever created. <laughs> yeah. I, I was trying to be pretty scientific with that. 
you know, and, and I'm watching, I'm going, that fellow don't know a free fuck about shooting. He was talking about the Taurus G3X like it was a fucking cosin. He don't know a goddamn thing about reloading, as is evident by watching him reload. But there's 40 comments about, hey, man, thanks for saving me. I was going to buy some of these primers. da 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 I'm telling you right now, because he thought they were trash, I ordered up a couple thousand of them bitches. I'm going to find out. Because something tells me I might be able to make them work. So here's what I'm going to say. Tonight's episode is not going to be a fucking college course on reloading, although I do teach one of those. I actually teach a college course on reloading. It's kind of interesting for SDI. But tonight's going to be this. Everyone be afraid. I've Here's the thing. I haven't hurt any students that I'm aware of. And if I did hurt them, they don't have their thumbs, so they can't tell me anyway. <laughs> no. Um, listen, here's the deal, right? <clears throat> if this is something you want to try, pick a gun that you are not emotionally attached to, right? No heirloom shit. Not granddaddies or grandmas or grandpas or papas gun. Like, whatever gun, not emotionally attached to. Pick a round that you are familiar with shooting. Normally. So, don't reload for a caliber that you don't shoot on a regular basis. Because you'll be less likely to understand if there's an issue. <clears throat> and then... Go ahead and invest in the basics. Right? Buy yourself the smallest jug of powder you can buy. Which is usually a pound. Get a pound of powder. Get your reloading manual. Get some primers. Collect some brass. Right? Buy some projectiles. And read that fucking manual. Read the intro, read the outro, read the history of the caliber, read the stuff in there about the basic uh, <clears throat> ballistics and trajectory information. Really and truly, like, read that shit. Not just for the caliber you're loading. Right. Then read yeah. another one. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned all you. you I, I knew you would. But I'm really glad you mentioned the importance and stress the importance of the reloading manual. Um, I have two of them, both from different manufacturers. I'm sure Kent has probably five or six. Um, the I, I can tell you this: the one place you don't want to go to get reloading data or information about the cartridge you're reloading is on a discussion forum, Facebook group, or otherwise. If it is not coming directly from a manufacturer of that equipment. Uh, for example, Hodgden, which is a well-known powder manufacturer, they have an entire online utility called the Hodgden Reloading Data Center um, that allows you to pick your cartridge or your caliber, right, rifle or pistol, and gives you, you know, pick your powder that you're using. It'll give you all the, the particulars about that. Um, but what it won't give you is all the additional information about reloading safety, how to prep cases, all that other stuff. That's the kind of information that's going to be found in those reloading manuals. I particularly have the Lyman reloaders manual from uh, the 49th edition. I also have the Hornady reloading manual 10th edition. Um, it can't, what's Lyman up to now? That, that, that. Uh, 50. That 50 so, is the latest one. Old books owned by other men. Buy used books. Gunsmith Kinks. It's a really cool book about various gunsmithing and reloading tricks. NRA Hand Loader's Guide from when the NRA was worth a buck. Yeah, Sir I will say this. Uh, you know, say what you want about the NRA's like firearms training certifications. Um, their reloading certifications are actually pretty legit. 
This particular work is from 1967. Spear Reloading Manual from 2014. Barnes, recent copy. Mosler, 10 years old. Lyman, 50th. Lyman, 47th. And actually, my uh, my laptop is being propped up on an angle so it can see me very good by a Hogden manual and a Bible. The Lord would be proud. I think that's pretty cool, right? So, for example, we'll go to Lyman 50th. A fella could, let's go find a, information section on jacketed bullets, what that means and how it affects reloading and pressures. That kind of information is in there, as well as, a recipe for something common, 760 by 39 Russian, AK ammo. There's all the data you need to load for your AK in the same book that explains to you, oh, I don't know, you and a half, you, USA boxer primers chart. Point being, if you want to know it about making ammo, it's in this book. This is the Betty Crocker cookbook for ammunition. Yep. This is that same book from a couple of years ago. Here's what's interesting. The data in the 50th does not always match the data in the 47th. As it turns out, the folks at Lyman are actually doing science, and they are constantly updating their work. So is Barnes. So is Nosler. So is Spear. So is the NRA. It's been years since the NRA has published load data, but... Here is some, right? Here's Pretty the fun part. Here's the fun part. This is something that should be very telling to each of you that are hearing the sound of my voice or watching this on YouTube. The data contained within those books is so valuable. Oftentimes, when you go to your local sporting goods store that may stock those books, oh yeah, those books are sealed hermetically oh. in shrink wrap. What other books? You can't find pornographic magazines <laughs> that are sealed hermetically to prevent people from seeing the content of their pages, right? Um, that should that should speak volumes to how valuable the information is. Um, you'll find helpful tips on things like fire forming, how you can fire form brass. Um, to a particular chamber, when to neck size versus full length size, um, all these different things that you're probably not going to get, you know, just listening to or following some chat on or, or chat forum on the internet. Like, oh yeah, just take this bullet and send it. All right. Speaking of which, Kent, since you have the Bards reloading manual, I will request that you send me pictures of the 300 blackout page, please. <laughs> Specifically for the 110 grain TSX projectile. Here we go. We'll do this live, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, give Sleep me a, yeah, give me a case overall length for a 300 blackout loaded with H110 19.3 grains and a 110 grain Barnes TSX projectile. Three hundred. It's funny because I can see the pages flickering past in your glasses, and it looks like you're loading. <laughs> you're loading the lo, lo, processing, processing. In the three hundred section. How do they have 300 blackout in the 300 section? This makes great radio, but we'll get there. Yeah, that's fine. 
Uh, yeah. So actually, I was I was presented with an interesting conundrum. In that, as I was looking through the reloading data for both my manuals, um, a 110 grain projectile um, has two completely different case overall lengths between the two books. Reloading data through Hodgson's uh, Reloading Data Center had a different set of numbers. Um, so at the end of the day, it was because of my knowledge and skill set and understanding of the reloading that the absolute case overall length was not going to be more than 2.26 inches because that is the longest that you can load. Now you can load them longer than that for say like a 200 grain or subsonic loads. But I can tell you that for supersonic loads, those things are probably going to be uh, compacted small enough to fit into the overall length of a standard AR-15 magazine. Hey, Blackout's not in here. Really? That's interesting. Especially considering I'm using their bullet. What's you the diameter of Blackout? 308. That's what I thought. Sure isn't. Hmm. Interesting. I might have to message Barnes about that. Not in here. But uh, long story short, I went slightly below uh, the 2.26 mark. And then I tested the loads and sure enough, I'm hitting out of a 10 and a half inch registered SBR with a suppressor on it. I'm holding a two MOA group at 100 yards, which is more than sufficient for deer. Oh, this is from 2008. Oh, that would explain That's it. I thought, you had it. I thought you had a newer edition. Yeah, 300 Blackout wasn't around back then. Should I? No, no. We There's more it. books over there. No, we'll find it. I was just hoping there would be specific load data from Barnes since I'm using Barnes projectiles. Oh, there's multiple Barnes books. Let's see if I can. There's the dead animals. There's the reloading presses. There's the reloading manuals. You guys see that? Yeah, you're going to have to point to it, buddy. We see a bookshelf of books. No, no. That side is the reloaded maintenance. The yeah. side with the, uh, yeah, there's a lot of books in the room. Yep. Oh, the side all above the weights is all the reloading data. Yep. Like, that's a lot. There's... And for those wondering, yes, Kent's basement does smell of rich mahogany and many leather-bound books. Well, it does. And there's also dry fires. It's a cool basement. Fuck you, my basement's the basement is basement that ever basemented. It did. It, indeed. You ain't, so. got indeed. you ain't got shit on my basement. All right. I've, so, anyway. I've got a cool background. You do. And, and that was a, it was a generalized deal. It wasn't even about you. It's just anybody. Ain't nobody got shit on my basement. I bet Elon <clears> Musk <throat> has got a cool basement. Well, okay. Ain't nobody who's not a millionaire got a fucking. So once we've got the reloaded manual in hand and we have a good thorough understanding of what we're going to load for, we then need tools to measure. We need calipers. We need scales. Oh, real quick. Fun life skill to learn how to read because digital calipers have their place, certainly quick and easy, but inevitably your batteries are going to die in those stupid things it is an awesome opportunity to learn how to use or how to read an analog caliper set yep i have both digital and analog because i reload no other reason yep so and the calipers if you're, if you're a grown-ass man in the united states of america by god you should know how to read a set of calipers if you can't read calipers i don't know what to tell you they can measure span. They can measure length. They can measure depth. It's actually what I use. I use calipers to. Uh, I use calipers to uh, square up my uh, iron sights on my guns. For Hell my yeah. pistols for my pistols. Oh yeah. Use the depth gauge. Very valuable. Yeah, depth gauge. The depth gauge works great for that. You just put it on one side of the sight. And hopefully that depth measurement is the same as the other side. Yep. That's exactly right. <clears throat> and, 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 then, and then I use and then I use a fine-tuning adjustment mechanism called a hammer. <laughs> yeah. You ever you ever use uh spark plug pin gauges? 
Oh, the, the little the, the little circle things that your dad would keep on his keychain. Yeah. A, a gap gauge. Yeah. Yeah, I've used them. What are those little things that come on the keychain that have the different? What the fuck are those called? To measure I mean, spark plug depth? Yeah, gap gauge. No, there's something else. There's another About name. About the size that. of a silver dollar. Yeah, 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 but hold on. No, now he's Googling. Loading. Hold on. It's feeler loading. gauge. Feeler gauge. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so I never saw I never saw feeler gauges on a keychain. Um now to be fair, that little you know circular disc that had the various you know had a ramp on it for spark plugs. I always called that a gap gauge. Um yeah. But yeah, feeler gauges. I've seen feeler gauges. You ever um, used I've, feeler uh, gauges to lever level a scope? No. Oh, oh. That's a good no. trick. That is a fun trick, but only if your scope has flat point flat points on it. Well, so it's got a flat bottom. Yep. She's got a flat uh, bottom. Daddy will play with her. <laughs> Let's see what else. <clears throat> um, uh, you mentioned uh, Wayne. Yep. So scales. we need a digital and an analog scale. I want two different scales. We need. See, that's the one thing I've always, I've always used, I've always used digital scales. Not me. Don't trust them. You'll end up, <clears throat> I use a digital scale to be quick. But I literally know that my digital scale and my analog scale are a quarter of a grain off of each other. Mm -hmm. And I know which one's right. Okay. That's fair. So, you know, digital when I'm close enough, analog when I'm getting serious. That's fair. Let's see what else. What else? What else? Lube. Yeah. Okay. Let me say, I will give you, I will mentor everybody on this part. As someone who has gotten expert level skill. On the RCBS stuck case remover. There's lube from Dylan. There's lube from uh, Hornady. Uh, I think it's called Hornady One Shot or whatever the hell it's called. Um, lanolin based lubricants. And this is specifically for uh, lubrication of the casing itself and even some of your dyes to keep the cases from getting stuck. Um, save yourself the time, energy, and effort. And just go to your local big box store, Lowe's, Home Depot, etc. Get yourself a can of the WD-40 dry lubricant. Mm -hmm. Works like a fucking charm. I can't, and Kent has heard me on the. He's been on the phone with me while I've been reloading five five six cases, and heard me. <laughs> cursing and swearing up a storm when yet another case got stuck. I told you I got expert level skills on that stuck case remover. You son of a motherless Episcopalian yep. fucking... Yep. That's about the size of That's a PG rated version. Um, but yeah, you get some of that dry lube, all your cares and worries will go away from a stuck case perspective. Um, and to be clear, I've only ever had problems with stuck cases on 556 with specifically... The RCBS small base full length sizing die. So I understand why it gets stuck. I or let me rephrase. I understand why it is predisposed to getting stuck. Doesn't mean I like it, <laughs> and I want to avoid it at all costs. Since I started using that uh, WD forty dry lubricant, never had a problem with it. Rifle rounds are generally loaded with steel dies, whereas pistol rounds are generally loaded with carbide dies. And the carbide material keeps us from having to use lubricant. Correct. Now, there are carbide rifle dies now. Yep. You're going to pay out the ass for them. They've even got dies that, are, that have micrometers attached to them. You want to spend $200 on a single die just to see the bullet to the exact dead nuts point of accuracy? 
by all means, go for it, Tater. But I can tell you it's generally not required. So, but, yeah. <clears throat> something else to understand is, is that you're, you're sciencing. There's a kitty cat. Hello. Sarge, you knocked, you knocked Slimer down. <laughs> Hello, Sarge. Goodbye, Sarge. That's, that's Sarge. He's an asshole. Poor Slimer. Yeah, now I gotta pick Slimer back up. There we go. <laughs> back in action. Okay. You good? Yep, we're good. Slimer, you wanna give me a mic check? Camera shy. It's that shit. All right. So let's see. Where was I? Where was I? I forgot. Oh, tumblers, Lube. lubricant. That's all good. Yep. Yep, Tubbers. Um, by the way, Harbor Freight is your Lord and Savior when it comes to some of this stuff. Um, there's no reason yeah. to go out and pay two, three, four hundred dollars for some of this equipment. Um, I mean, all my calipers came from from Harbor Freight. Never had an issue with them. Um, I'm not building a nuclear power plant, guys. I'm reloading ammunition. It doesn't have to be brain surgery. Um, Turns out Ashton is building nuclear power plants, but Ashton is, but as a lube doctor lube doctor exactly right. i would expect i would expect nothing less um but yeah like the case of, like a matter of fact uh, kent and i just had to invest in new tumblers because the tumblers we both had for what a decade and a half have finally eat, have finally bit the dust they gave up the they, ghost uh, mine took a tumble oh jesus my tumbler tumbled my so i had the i started with the one from frankfurt arsenal frankfurt arsenal is is typically known as a budget friendly reloading manufacturer um i've had my re my frankfurt arsenal tumbler since i started reloading and just this past weekend it died on me it broke um so quick trip up to harbor freight got a new five pound tumbler back in business yeah keep in mind guys uh i want to talk a little bit about procedures testing and stuff like that you are science -ing. And you're doing it with explosives. And you're, and you're sciencing with explosives. So, a couple things. You can never measure too many times. Nope. You can never weigh too much. You can never check too many variables. Uh, I'm loading 9 millimeter at a rate of about 1,000 rounds an hour on a Dillon 750 progressive reloading press right now. Okay. The reason it's a thousand rounds an hour is because I stopped the machine to take measurements. I'm checking primer depth. I'm checking crimp. Checking cartridge overall length. I'm checking powder. I'm checking bullet seating depth. <clears throat> My press, being a progressive press, has a station, an extra spot that I don't normally use. So that's got a powder check die in it, which means every round I make is powder checked yep. at the very least. Survey says that's the one that might blow your hand off. Yeah, that, that powder check is not necessary in all instances, but if you have a progressive press, I would argue that it is. I, I think it's 100% necessary for everything other than single-stage reloading. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, anything other than, yeah, any progressive press. Um, turret presses, yeah, yeah. If, you got the, if you got the room for it. Um, but, so just real quick, I, I understand I, I, we're venturing into a territory that we haven't set up a premise for. So there are essentially three different types of reloading presses. Single-stage, which is one procedure in the reloading process at a time. So resize and deep prime, resize and deep prime. Every time I pull that handle, one piece of brass is going to get resized and deep primed. When it comes time to uh, add the powder, I might have a different station that does that. Um, like in, in my particular setup, my powder dropper or my powder measure is separate from my reloading press. Uh, I also hand prime all of my cartridges. 
So resize it, deprime everything, maybe tumble it, get it nice and clean, clean it all out, get the primer, you know, seat the primers, add the powder, casing back into the reloading press for the bullet seating, right? So actually putting the bullet into the casing. Uh, so one piece or of the process at a time. Then you get into what's called a turret press. Um, essentially the same thing, but rather than having to change a die out for every step, you just rotate manually that either usually the head of the press, right? Some may be different, like the Dillon 550. You can actually manually advance the casing through the next step. I call that kind of a hybrid. Um, but generally speaking, single stage uh, and then a turret press, which is a multi-stage, but still you're only performing one action with every pull of the handle. Then you get into a progressive press, which every time you pull the handle, you are advancing the, the casing automatically through the process. And when it's fully cued, every time you pull that handle, you should be spitting out a completed round. Okay. So yep. uh, there's, there's plenty of YouTube videos out there that explain the difference. Again, um, Ga uh, Gavin from, uh, from ultimate reloader. Um, he did a, a single stage and a progressive press shoot off where he compared all the different presses in that category against each other. Um, I don't know that he did a turret press one though. He had a five fifty in there. Yeah, he had a five fifty in there. But either way, there's plenty of content out there. But just for sake of argument, um, or to catch you guys up to where we're at, um, that's the difference between the three. Continue, sir. I would I would say the last thing that we'll talk we'll talk about for tonight, and this is going to have to be a multi parter, obviously. Is testing procedures in the gun live testing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, what you don't want to do is make a thousand rounds of something and go test it. No, because you have a problem, then you're about to be pulling. When we say pulling, we mean getting the bullet back out of that case and getting the primer out of it. And you're going to be pulling every single round you made. So, that's annoying. What you want to do is make a couple test rounds. Some a little longer, some a little shorter, some with a little more powder, some with a little less powder. All within the prescribed recipes. Right. To the point where you end up, let's say with five options. Nine millimeter, 147 grade, order DXTP. Loaded with a Winchester small pistol primer, 3.2 grains of tight group, and a cartridge overall length of 110 of an inch. Make up five of them. Would have been a little baggy. Maybe make 10 of them. Make another baggy that's everything the same, except now you have 3.3 grains of tight group. Another baggy, all the same, 3.4. Another baggie, all the same, 3.5. Another baggie, all the same, 3.6. If you do your loading recipes for 147 grade XDPs, like I do, you would know I just covered that whole ladder. Minimum charge is 3.2. Max charge is 3.6. My advice to you is never load max. Not a big fan. I don't see a need for it. Keep in mind, I reload predominantly pistol ammo. And I'm not pushing velocities for velocity's sake. Yeah, even even I don't. Well, I take that back. I will avoid loading max without testing if it is a compressed load. So what I mean by yeah. compressed load, right? This is more common in, in, in rifle cartridges. But the volume of the car of, of the casing. And the amount of powder that you put into it, when you press the or seat the bullet into the casing to the prescribed depth, that projectile may be coming in contact and compressing the powder within the case itself. That is a compressed load. Uh, typically, you're dealing with relatively high pressures or the higher end of the pressure spectrum uh, when it comes to that load data. Um, again, I will still I'll get there eventually. Like I will test it, 
but it will be incredibly deliberate and intentional. Now I'm fortunate in that the range that I go to that I am a member of the owner of that range has the foresight that he actually installed a reloading room at the rifle range. It's got the press. It's got a powder measure. You literally just need to bring your dyes, your primers, your powder, your projectiles and your brass, right? Um, you can go in there, load you up four or five rounds, like Kent saying, go out, you know, literally step right outside, fire them at the range, take note of what the performance was, go back into the range. You, you, so you don't have to do the whole baggy thing that Kent is talking about, though that is the more common approach because most people don't have access to those type of resources. Um, but yeah, sure as hell, he's got a rock chucker with an RCBS um powder what the hell's the the powder the automatic powder measure for rcbs what the hell is that thing called again kent trickler yeah the trickler but what's the name i can't remember what the name of the actual like you can program in the grain weight you want and it'll automatically dispense yeah. i just can't powder remember. master powder, powder master. master or charge master charge powder. master that's what it's called thank you um you got me there buddy um but yeah, it's uh, it's it's pretty dope to have those things. But yeah, most people don't have those things or have access to that type of, of a resource. Um, so yeah, there's nothing wrong with doing a little bit of advanced homework and you know building your baggie. You know, you're getting your little dealer baggies with your five or six or eight or ten bullets, and then going to the range and testing them out. Right. So once we're at the range, how do we test them out? Load a bag and shoot six. One at a time. Yeah. Maybe sort of kind of like. Yeah, maybe at a distance with a safety string. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've, I've done that with shotguns before, by the way. Yeah. Um, um, that's a that's a story for another podcast. But. But, yeah, I mean, if I have, you know, call it, you know, a, a dozen rounds that I've loaded up. For a particular uh, recipe, I'll one at a time, literally hand load the one. I'll leave the magazine in it because what I'm looking for is I'm also looking for it to fully cycle the firearm, right? If I'm loading for pistol ammo and I'm loading some cheater rounds for you know a USPSA or IDPA match, um, I want to make sure that it's going to cycle the slide far enough back to lock the magazine to the rear, right? I want that full action. Once I know that it's doing that, and of course the gun didn't grenade itself. Then I might load two or three and just make sure that those last two or three will go through a full firing cycle of, you know, loading, firing, extracting, locking, ejecting. unlocking, chambering, yeah. extracting, yeah. ejecting. Yeah, the seven phases. This what is it? The seven yeah. steps of the firing process. There you go. Good so, boy. I used, to, I used to be able to rattle that shit off, um, but yeah, there's nothing wrong with it, guys. Um, <clears throat> actually yeah it's got too much crap on it I'll, I'll, you know we ought to do a tour one day of our of our loading setups i've actually got a new mount coming i'm moving my my single stage press from my garage to my desk here i've, I've got a new workbench set up in here for reloading yeah, oh, look, at that. The... look at that look at that pretty blue reloader over there yeah but you can't see the new bougie one because it's behind the punching bag yeah yeah we'll have to do a tour Yep. So. Yep, we can. I'm tired. We're done. Yep, I think we're at about there, folks. Um, seriously, can't. What do you What do you got in wrap up though? Uh, a quick discussion on attitude and safety is probably warranted for a wrap up. So, this is not the thing to undertake under the influence of anything. This is not the thing to undertake without an understanding of the entirety of what you're bringing into your home. Raw powder, raw primers, lead, toxins, mm -hmm. heavy metals, ventilation, all that shit matters. And if you're not the type of person who can't get a fishing rod tangled and just untangle it without swearing, don't reload. <laughs> Or, or square your life away first. I mean, this is the most frustra frustrating, fun hobby. Like, it'll get under your skin sometimes. Oh, yeah. The other thing is, if you're going to do like me, 
and feed your entire training company with reloads or a big batch of them. You better be damn sure you got your data and your settings squared away if you're going to make tens of thousands of rounds. My biggest suggestion from a safety perspective is to start at small batches and work your way up to volume. It's so, so tempting for a guy to want to just stack it deep right away. And that's not always the best idea. Get a mentor. Be safe. Realize what you're handling. Don't be under the influence of any bad substances. Follow posted recipes. Ask plenty of questions. Go take a class. There are absolutely reloading classes out there. Go take them. They're valuable. Be good, stay safe, get training. www.greenmountainfence.com forward slash training. Class is posted all the time. TJ is being cast in Ghostbusters. Stop, I I would be so excited. (laughs) Stop, I can only get so erect. What do you got, man? Take us out of here. Yep, that's all the time we have for this week, folks. Thank you, as always, for tuning in and and, and bringing us with you along for your... uh, commute uh if you're listening to this on your local podcast player i uh, thank you for tuning in on our youtube channel and checking out the live show or the pre-recorded video broadcast of this episode um obviously guys if you have questions uh comments um anything you want to add to us sling, uh sling lead podcast at gmail.com uh hit us up on facebook or you can post a comment down below of this video and we will get to it possibly in the next episode thank you all for your time god bless you all take care of each other get out and shoot Bye, everybody.